Welcome. My name is Daryl Miller. I'm an API architect on the Microsoft Graph team. This session is uh, a deep dive into Microsoft Graph SDKs. And first, we're going to briefly review some of the technology that is powering the next generation of the Microsoft Graph SDKs. And then we're going to talk about the different options that are available to meet your needs for your particular scenarios. We'll talk a little bit about timelines of when we're going to deliver this next generation of SDKs. And then we'll get into a set of demos to show you actually how it works. If you had the opportunity to see the graph overview session, you'd have seen some demos and a glimpse into this tooling that we're going to be diving deeper into. You would see how you can use the Graph Explorer and the new Resource Explorer to be able to select the parts of Microsoft Graph that you're interested in, export them to a Postman collection, and then use that to slice the large open API description for Microsoft Graph into something more manageable and create yourself a self-serve SDK. If you haven't seen it yet, I'd highly recommend it. Now, Kyoto, this is the tool that we use for generating SDKs. Now, it started out by just being a tool to make us more efficient, to pay off some technical debt and allow us to deliver features faster. We've close to 300,000 applications that are built using SDK, our SDKs to call Microsoft Graph. We produce those SDKs in nine languages, and our APIs get updated twice a week, and there are currently more than 10,000 API operations. Agility is really important to us. We continue to focus on building SDKs that are easy to use. We give you that strongly typed experience for making requests and dealing with the responses that come back. They are secure APIs using the Azure Identity Library, so you can use the same credentials that you use for calling Azure APIs to be able to call Microsoft Graph APIs. And flexibility is key. We want you, if you run into some situation that's not quite right, to be able to peel that onion and give you complete control over the requests that are being made. We want resilient applications, so we automatically handle retries for you and redirect, and we focus on performance. We have efficient serialization and deserialization code built into those SDKs. But Kyoto is enabling us to bring more. We have an improved developer experience. We've learned a lot from uh, the SDKs that we've delivered of the last seven years, and we've worked with the Azure architects on what they have learned in their usability studies with their SDKs, and we've done a number of improvements in the surface area of the API. We've added more language support, more capabilities, and we can support more features of the Microsoft Graph API. But one of the most interesting new capabilities that Kyoto brings is this notion of the self-serve experience. Now, we're going to use an analogy for this. It's interesting. In, back in 2014, Albert Barron from IBM invented the analogy as the pizza as a service for cloud computing. And it compared on-prem versus IaaS and PaaS and SaaS in terms of how you go get your pizza. It turns out with a few tweaks, this analogy is helpful for explaining the different ways to call APIs and also our self-serve model. So over on the left, you can go build your pizza from scratch. And that's equivalent to go using the native library in your own programming language and platform and just building everything yourself, the authentication, the retry handling, the serialization. You can do it yourself is a perfectly viable supported model for accessing Microsoft Graph. Or you could use our core library. Creating a pizza, well, sometimes the hardest part is actually the dough, the, core, the, the base of that pizza. And you go by the dough, you can go use our core library to give, us that, that give you that hard stuff, the middleware, the authorization. It's those standard HTTP capabilities. And we've always actually separated our SDKs into kind of a core library and a service library. And ironically, it actually fits into the pizza model very nicely. You have the base, and then you choose the toppings, because the toppings are specific to the particular API that you're interested in. Which brings us to the self-serve model. 
Because the self-serve model is interesting because with our Kyoto tooling, the way that we've built it, it is easy for anybody to use within their own developer tool chain. And so they can go and use that tooling to be able to create themselves a service library that is just what they need. They can basically pick their own toppings for the pizza. But you've got to go pick it up. You've got to package that source code that you've code generated and deliver it with your application. Now, over on the far right, we have still, we're still going to be delivered fully packaged SDKs. We will take the entire Graph SDK, both the V1 and the beta, we'll package it up for you and deliver it to your favorite package manager, whether it's Nougat or Maven or PyPy, whatever language you have to be working in. So let's talk more about what we are going to deliver. We've already started shipping previews of our prepackaged SDKs, and we expect to GA all of our SDKs this year. We introduced the new language support for Go, and we were able to deliver that as a private preview back in December. Here at Build, we're announcing private previews for JavaScript TypeScript, for .NET, for PHP, Python, and our new CLI, which we co-generate using the same technology, a .NET cross-platform command line tool for being able to call anything in Microsoft Graph. Following shortly after build, we'll be releasing a private preview for Java. And then sometime between build and Ignite, based on your feedback, we will ship release candidates of all of these SDKs. And our goal is to be able to GA all of them by Ignite of this year. So let's take a little bit of a deeper dive into just the .NET SDK. If you take a look at this code snippet, if you're familiar with our existing SDKs, you'll see it's fairly similar. You still create the request using a client object and use the autocomplete of your IDE to prompt you through that hierarchy of resources to be able to find the resource you're looking for and then choose the operation that you want, whether it's a get or a put or a delete. You'll notice there's no longer a request method that sits in that chain of calls. We don't need that anymore. We've been able to add the operations directly onto the resource request factories. Another slight difference is now we take this callback object as a parameter so that you can configure the request. And that callback lets you do it in a strongly typed way so that you can select query parameters or you could set headers. You can, you can even change the response handling or you can configure the middleware. But enough talking, let's see a demo of this in action. So in order to give you a feel for the .NET SDK, I'm here in VS Code with a really simple uh, console application. But before we talk about this code, I'm just gonna th go over to the project file. You can see in the project file, we have reference to just two projects. One is the Azure Identity, because we're gonna use that for getting ourselves token to Microsoft Graph. And I've pulled in the Microsoft Graph beta library that gives us access to the full surface area of Microsoft Graph. In our program file here, first thing I do is new up the service. I'm going to get all the teams, and then I'm going to go and get the channels for each of the teams. Now, you may be looking at those methods going, hey, that doesn't look like the code that you just showed a moment ago. And that's right, because our best practice is we recommend that you create yourself a service to wrap around our library. Create yourself an interface that says, I want to be able to call these parts of Microsoft Graph, and then go implement that inside the surface, the, inside your graph service. The Microsoft Graph service area is really large, and having that interface is really helpful when it comes to being able to mock it and be able to test your application independently of calling the API. And so you'll see in the service here we have, um, I have a client ID because I'm going to need that for the token. I have the scopes that we need to be able to call stuff. And in the constructor to this uh, class, uh, I create the interactive browser credential. I can create any, I can do device code, I can do manage, use client secret, depending on the environment that I'm in. And here, uh, I provided the client ID, and I just pass that credential into our Graph service client along with the scopes. And then I hold on to 
a copy, an instance, that instance of the graph service client. It is thread safe. We recommend to create an instance of this service as a singleton and then reuse it over and over again uh, throughout your application. And so if we head over to take a look at the th two methods that will have implemented, get all teams and get teams channels, now you'll see this style of chained methods that we have in Microsoft Graph. And if I were to go here and hit the dot, you can see uh, you can access all of Microsoft Graph and you can dot your way through to create the path to be able to create the request that you're looking for to get at the data that you're interested in. You'll notice that there's no longer a dot request if you're familiar with our old SDKs. We allow you to, on each of the objects in that path, to either navigate further to create a longer path or actually call the methods get post, whatever is supported directly. And if you want to customize the method to be able to set query parameters, for example, you have a strongly typed experience here where you can set the search and select and skip, whatever is supported will appear in those in that callback method that you can provide as a parameter. And so proof is in the pudding. Let's run this and go see if everything works and it's interactive browser, so it should pop up the browser uh, and allow me to sign in. I'm gonna click sign in. It already knows my password because I've done this enough times. And if we scroll down here, and uh, yeah, there we go. We can see the team, the channel, teams and the channel. So this is a simple example. It's up on GitHub and links are in the slides. Go take a look at it, go play around with it. And so, that was our .NET experience. Next up, let's take a look at TypeScript. Now, being able to create requests in a strongly typed way has been a long-standing request for the, uh, the Microsoft Graph community members. And so here we have a, a very similar experience where you can start with the client object and let autocomplete show us what is possible. And then a typed options object allows us to configure the behavior of the request if needed. And so let's go see a demo of this in action. What we have here is a very simple Node.js TypeScript application that is going to call Microsoft Graph and get presence, your availability. And as we mentioned in the .NET example, we recommend to encapsulate all the calling of Microsoft Graph into a module, and that's what we created this graph service, and it has exported this get presence method. So let's go take a look at the graph service module. You can see we have imported device code credential from Azure Identity, because we're going to use that to go get a credential. We'll then pass that credential into our Azure Identity Auth provider that will work as an adapter. So our graph service client that we pull in from our JavaScript SDK will be able to go and get a token when it needs it. We need a client ID and we have a little bit of setup for our device code credential. Obviously, you can use any kind of Azure credential here in order to get that token. Moving on, we then pass that credential into the Azure Identity Auth provider. We say, look, we only want to go get tokens for graph.microsoft.com. And you're going to need the claim presence.read in that token in order to be able to call this particular API. We pass the auth provider into Graph Service Client, and we hold on to a copy of that Graph Service Client so we can use it over and over again. In our method, get presence, we call Graph Service Client me.presence.get, and we can discover all kinds of other resources in the same way with the autocomplete. And the get method will accept parameters so that you can provide expand and select or specify headers or customize the behavior in a variety of different ways. We get the presence object back, and then we get a strongly typed model where we can pick the activity or availability of, that comes back from that pre presence call. And so let's head on over to uh, our main application and go run this. And that's going to execute, and then it's going to prop, pop up our device code flow prompt. There we go. 
and I'm going to grab this code. I'm going to click over on here and it's going to open the web browser for us. We are going to provide it that prompt and it's going to sign in. Well, no, I'm going to sign in and say, yes, I want to use this particular app. And you'll see over here, I am actually signed in with Teams and I am available. So when you see, oh, I'm away. Okay, well, I guess it waited long enough and decided that I wasn't there anymore. And so that is uh, how we call Microsoft Graph from JavaScript and TypeScript. And so there you go. We have the TypeScript demo. Next up is uh, our last language that I want to show today is our newest supported language, which is Go. And if you look at the last line in this sample, you'll see once again this very similar pattern of you have a client object, and we navigate through the resource hierarchy, and then we can choose the operation. And we can pass in an options object to be able to configure exactly how you want that request to work. And so, Let's go see how this works with the demo. Here we are back in VS Code to see how we can use the Microsoft Graph SDK for Go. Before we take a look at this main program, I just want to switch over to the module file, which is where Go applications are, provide their dependencies. You can see that we have a first dependency here on Azure Identity to be able to go and get credentials. And then we have uh, our adapter that allows us to use those credentials in the MS Graph SDK for Go, which in this case, I'm pulling in the uh, SDK for the V1 API. You will notice that down in the corner, I'm actually connected to WSL here. The full package from Microsoft Go is very large and uh, Go and WSL work better uh, for that. those large libraries than using it in native Windows. If we go back to the program, you can see we import in a graph service, the same idea we talked about before, encapsulating the SDK to expose just the pieces of it that you want in the way that you want it. So in this case, we're going and accessing the drive, getting a drive object, checking to make sure that works successfully, and then showing the web URL uh, of that drive. If we go into the graph service, you can see this is defined as a package. We pull in all of the dependencies and then create a package level variable to hold on to that client instance, the graph service client, very much similar to the way we've done it in other languages. Using the client ID and the device code credential, we set up being able to go and get tokens as we need them. And then we create an authentication provider using that token saying, yes, we're going to call graph.microsoft.com. And these are the scopes that are required. And finally, we create an adapter in order to be able to map our SDK calls to the native Go library and put those all together into our client. This only gets done once during initialization of the module. Now, in this function get drive, we now can call our client and use our standard pattern of dotting through the path and then calling the operation we want. You can see here, if I hit the dot, I get the full IntelliSense experience. And if I can pass, if I choose, I can pass a parameter into get to provide all of the options for selecting and expanding and filtering. And so with that, let's go build this. That created us an executable that we can now run. There's the executable. We grab this code. We go to device code login. It's going to open our browser. We provide it with the code and we sign in and we confirm. We head back. And you can now see the user drive has a URL of this. This is the URL to the drive. So you've now seen the experience in three different languages. I can imagine you can imagine what the experience would be like in Python and PHP and Java. And if those are your languages, I uh, should really uh, go try it out. Now, next up, our final demo is a little different. In this case, the goal isn't to show a different language, but this time a completely different API. Now, Kyoto, our code generator, will work with any open API, but 
Dataverse, the Dynamics 365 API, like Microsoft Graph, is actually an OData API. And so it uses a different API description language called CSDL to describe it. But fear not, we have solutions for that. So let's take a look. Here we have a folder that has a Dataverse CSDL file. So this is an API description of a Dynamics 365 API. And we're going to use this API description to build us an SDK. Now, Kyoto doesn't use CSDL directly. It works using OpenAPI. And so the first step we have to take is we have to create ourselves an open API from this CSDL. And to do that, we're going to use this tool Hidi. Now I've run this tool. Now I'll explain to you how this works. Hidi is a command line tool that is available as a .NET package that you can download. And we're going to transform this CSDL file into an open API file called competitors.yaml because we don't want the entire surface area. This is a really large open API file, uh, oh, CSDL file. And so we're going to filter it on just the competitors. And it's created an open API file with 70 paths, effectively 70 APIs. So now we have the open API file, competitors.yaml. We're now going to generate our SDK from this. And for this, we'll use the Kyoto command line tool. I'm going to paste this command in and let it run. So here we're taking competitors.yaml as an input. We're going to output all the files into competitors SDK. We're going to create a class called competitors client in the namespace competitors SDK. And by default, unless I provide a language, it generates C sharp. And you can see that it's processing this information and it's building a model and it's applying language specific refinements. And now it's writing out those files to disk. Now, in order to try out this SDK, we're going to just create ourselves a little console application. So we'll use .NET new console and for the console to be able to actually build, it will need some of our dependencies of our core Kyoto libraries. And so we will just add those dependencies. So the Kyoto abstractions, the HP client library that provides the adapter to the native library, serializations for both JSON and text. And so now we have all that set up. Let's go into VS Code. I'm going to start by just making a minor change to this project file to disable this nullable, or otherwise it's going to give us a, a whole bunch of warnings. And let's go to our main program file. You can see the competitors SDK folder with all of the mechanisms for accessing what we call our request builders to be able to make requests and all the model classes that have been generated here for Dataverse. If I just go remove this code and create using competitors SDK, and because that was the namespace that I selected, and I create myself a client, new competitors. Oops, if only I could spell competitors client. Now, I don't have an adapter. I haven't done that setup, but you've seen how that works. Now I do client. I hit dot. I see competitors. If I hit dot here, I can see that I can get the list of competitors. I can add a competitor. I can now index into competitors. So by providing some key identifier here, I can now access all of the relationships, the addresses, all that information that is available via the API is now directly available to me via a strongly typed API service area. And so with these pieces of tooling, you can get access to any API that you want, whether they're described using CSDL or with OpenAPI. In this demo, 
we generated an SDK for Dataverse. But this works just as well for any open API described API. In fact, maybe even your own. If you use ASP.NET that has uh, for to build a web API, it has Swashbuckle installed, it will generate you an open API for your API, and you can use this. We demoed this using C Sharp, but it works for any of our supported languages. If your customers want to call your API using PHP or Python, you can use this tooling to help. And if you're interested in adding support for other languages, Kyoto is an open source project. Come talk to us on GitHub. So to recap, Kyoto, our new API-based code generator, it's available. Go try it. Check out our Microsoft Graph prepackaged Kyoto SDKs that are currently in preview and give us your feedback. You can really impact the way that we are going to deliver those finally when they come out later this year. And try using it yourself to generate an, an SDK uh, for your own APIs and give us feedback on that too. Thank you very much.